Okay, can everybody see just the big slide that says personal archiving, the basics of family, of saving your family papers and not a bunch of notes? Okay, good. I, I've been asking that question for two years now because um, it's the one time I'll switch it over and uh, everybody will see my, my deep, dark secrets and not... <laughs> and not the, uh, not the slides. Okay. I think we're ready. So I am Heather Register Zabinden. I am the research, I'm not, I'm no longer any of that. Let me, I've got a new title. Um, Programs and Website Coordinator for the Roberts Library here at the Central Arkansas Library System. And I am the one that kind of oversees the memory lab along with my colleague, Anna Lancaster. And so this is kind of the precursor, your prerequisite to come and use the memory lab. You can still use it without doing this class, but why would you want to? Um, so, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's go back one slide. Um, a little of how a little bit of housekeeping at the end I will take questions um this this program will take about an hour for me to give and then we'll we'll take questions um at that point we received a grant to do this memory lab um, from the DC Public Library and the Institute for Museum and Library Services in 2019 um, and we are part of the National Memory Lab Network of course, we got it at the end of 2019. Um, we went to this boot camp in DC in January of 2020, and then the world fell apart. Um, and so we um, we have just now been able to actually open our memory lab so that you could come and use it. The grant funded this training as well as parts of our memory lab. Um, there are videos and a supply list at robertslibrary.org slash memory lab. Um, I'll put that in the chat here in just a minute so that you'll be able to look at those. Um, and like I said, I'll answer questions at the end. You can either um, ask them by typing them in the chat or going to um, raising your hand with the raise hand feature and ask on um, live on camera. So. This presentation, the content, slides, and other materials are under copyright and may not be reproduced without prior written permission of the Central Arkansas Library System. And if you've been to this class before, I've actually just tweaked it a little bit. So um, hopefully you'll get some new and different information. There is not a handout. Um, everything is on our website. Let me put that web address in. I can't type and talk at the same time. Whoops. Okay, so robertslibrary.org slash memory lab slash will get you to the web page about the memory lab and that's where you'll have the supply list and you can have, you'll also see links there to um, previous previously recorded versions of this program. This program itself is being recorded and will be live streamed um, on YouTube. Um, immediate, I mean, it's actually happening right now. So you'll be able to see it right after um, it's all over if you need to go back and look at anything. So the do-it-yourself memory lab is now open. All of it is open, finally. Um, we, we opened the flatbed scanner to scan photographs in May and just two, I guess last week, not even two weeks ago, last week, the AV side of the lab opened for VHS, beta, and audio cassette. At some point, we'll have other formats there, but that's what we've got right now, VHS, beta, and audio cassette. It's located on the third floor of the Roberts Library in downtown Little Rock. Um, we are at, the physical address of this building is 401 President Clinton Avenue. Um, but you, most people think of it as like Clinton Avenue and Rock Street, where the big metal um, glass building across from the main library. And we'll validate your parking in either the parking deck or the service lot on Rock Street. 
You can make reservations to use the Memory Lab um, by going to that link I just put in the chat, robertslibrary.org slash memory lab. Reservations are two hours long and you can make them back to back. You can also make concurrent reservations where you're working, you're, while you're digitizing something VHS-ish in the um, AV station, you can be scanning photographs as well. And we actually had somebody do that this week where she used both sides at the same time. The first 30 minutes of any appointment, the first time you make an appointment on one of the two stations, you'll get a brief orientation on how to use our specific equipment. So that's where that orientation um, falls in line. So the flatbed scanner, you can scan photographs up to 11 by 14, um, negatives of various sizes and shapes, as well as mounted slides. Um, VHS right now, we're only digitizing, sorry, AV, we're only digitizing VHS, beta, and audio cassette. So here's what I am going to cover in today's program. So like I said, it'll take about an hour and then we'll do 30 minutes for questions. Um, I will say in the spring of 2020, I did a really long deep dive. It was four one hour sessions. So yes, that's four hours of personal archiving. Um, those are available on the CALS YouTube channel if you feel so inclined to watch them and get even more information. Although I think at this point, I've probably streamlined it enough you may get a lot of information you didn't need before. Um, there's also a one hour abridged version um, of this program that you can watch there. Although I am a public historian and have some training in archival processes, I always like to tell people, these are not necessarily archival best practices. Um, we actually think of them as goodish practices that are getting the job done for you as this lay person trying to get your personal archive together. So the things that we're gonna talk about today, the, the kind of the four sections of this program are, start with the end, which is about storage, clumping, which is organizations, the evil of tape, um, and going digital. So what is the point? Why is personal archiving important? Who will want all this old stuff? And that's a direct quote from my paternal grandmother who just could not understand why anybody would want um, all her old crap, as she called it. Um, for historians, the personal papers of everyday people are the great discoveries of the work we do. I would argue that personal archives, the personal papers of everyday people are more important and more significant to the study of human history than the papers of the great, the famous, or the infamous. Plus, there are more of us everyday people than there are of them, and the details of our lives are going to tell a more accurate story of how we lived. The papers, photographs, and letters you've got stored in your basements, attics, and closets can show us how things used to be done and how things in our world, how the things in our world have changed. A good example of that is you take this picture here of a phone booth, a telephone booth from Ravendale, California. Did you ever think in your lifetime that pay phones would be obsolete, that you would not have to carry a dime or a quarter in your pocket to make um, a call or to call collect if you needed to um, from the side of, a of the road? I sure didn't. Um, I spent, I feel like most of my, my childhood making sure I had a dime or a quarter um, in my pocket. But um, about seven years ago, I was watching Fields of Dreams with my son, you know, the Kevin Costner movie about baseball. Um, and Kevin Costner, the character that Kevin Costner plays, stops and uses a payphone. And my son, who was about seven at the time, <laughs> looks at me and says, why is he doing that? Um, and it wasn't until that moment that I realized that my kid had never seen a payphone, had never had to use a payphone. So something that was so integral to my growing up um, my child will never experience. Um, and so, so that was kind of, that kind of just hits home why our stories are so important, why the things that we experienced um, as children and adults is so important to future generations. 
So we're going to start with the end, and this is the this is the practical storage solutions um, and supplies that you'll need on your personal archiving journal. Again, there's that um, web address, robertslibrary.org/memorylab, um, which will give you copies of the supply lists um, and links to the videos. So you're going to need to determine how you're going to store everything what types of containers you're going to need. But don't think that you have to go buy everything all at once. Um, this is gonna be a process. You're gonna hear me say several times that this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, and so you may go and buy a few containers at first. And as you work your way through your collection, you'll need to go and buy more. So just don't think that you have to rush out and buy everything all at once. So the whole idea of personal archiving, the whole point of this, aside from saving it, is that you're going to digitize everything and then you're going to store the original away where you cannot get your hands on it, preferably, sometimes you need to, but preferably you're not going to handle it and you're going to share the digitized versions with friends and family um, so that you don't have a bunch of hands touching it. Again, a supply list and now actually also a vendor list is available on our website um, at robertslibrary.org slash memory lab. Um, the vendor list will give you the three vendors that I think are the most accessible to buy some of these supplies, some of these more specialized supplies. So the idea is to get multiple barriers between your, your item, your, ar your archival precious thing, and the outside environment. So you'll have your photo, and then your photo will be in a folder, maybe with a piece of mylar around it, and then that folder will be in a box, and that box will live in a closet under hopefully a roof and not in your attic um, with the outside environment. So there, there's your number of, of of barriers. That slide went too fast. Okay, let's go back. My tree was supposed to wave and then it was supposed to stop. <laughs> Technology, right? Um, I do want to kind of give a warning to beware of big box arts and crafts supply stores that you might have in your town as well as scrapbooking supplies. Um, acid free is a great kind of catchphrase, archival quality, acid-free sometimes is used. Um, most of these, most of the supplies you're gonna find at those big box stores, as well as scrapbooking supplies are not actually archival. And they're most likely not acid-free to the level that you would want them to be. So locally here in Little Rock, you can actually get archival boxes and acid-free tissue paper at the container store. And then there are online sources like Gaylord um, or University Products are two vendors that we actually buy from here um, at the Butler Center. Um, you can also find these things on Amazon. And personally, that's where I got it because Amazon gets me things quickly, you know. They're all of a sudden there at my doorstep before I even realized I had ordered them. Um, so you're going to want to start with kind of your boxes. And this box, this thing called a Hollinger box, is kind of the gold standard, gold standard in archival supplies. Um, you're going to want to buy the legal size, not the letter size. And you're going to want to buy legal size, acid-free archival folders. Um, you may also want to get a piece of blue board, which is also out acid free if you need a spacer because you can't fill your box all the way up with stuff. Acid free isn't acid free forever, but it should remain acid free for our lifetime and that of our children if you're buying good quality acid free. So other supplies um, that you'll need acid free tissue paper, maybe some acid free like I don't want to call it copy paper, but you know, eight and a half by 11 paper. Um, pencils, Micron Pigma pens, you can buy those at the big box craft stores and they're just as good as where you're gonna, they're the same, it's a brand, Micron. I think Micron's the brand, I guess the brand is um, different, but it's called Micron and so you can get those there. And then I always like to have some plastic paper clips around because 
you're going to want to hold that's going to you'll you'll see i'll explain the plastic paper clips in a second um you may want to invest in some mylar sleeves and i fell in love with these little what i call a pocket envelope which is sealed on three sides and i could get a whole lot of photos in in one um, to kind of keep them organized You may want to take the extra step of purchasing a fire safe file box or file cabinet. Um, these can be really expensive and they're incredibly heavy because they are fire, fire, they are fire safe. So they're not real movable um, and they do need to kind of, you know, be on like a ground level. But if you if you think that you're going to need if you're dealing with a lot of legal documents or prop, property deeds that you are going to need to access the original on a somewhat regular basis, you may want to invest in one of these just to be extra safe. So where are you going to store it once it's digitized and rehoused? Um, you don't want to store your personal archive in the basement. Even a finished basement can have a moisture problem that you can't even, you don't even notice, but paper loves moisture. Um, you don't want to store it in a garage or an attic. Um, and if you pulled it out of a barn, please don't put it back in the barn. Climate control, controlled offsite storage, let me try that again. Climate controlled offsite storage might be good if you don't have a space in the main part of your house or apartment to accommodate these items. My stuff lives, all full disclosure, my stuff lives in the top of a closet in the middle of my house. Uh, it was kind of hard to get it up into the closet. So that guarantees that I'm not going to get it out of the closet in, unless we move. Okay, clumping or organizing like things. Um, the first thing you need to do to get ready to use the memory lab is to get your papers and photos organized before you come here. Um, and the Library of Congress actually really calls this process clumping. So before you start clumping, though, here are a couple of important tips. If you are dealing with papers of different sides of your family and they are already separated by family or better yet individual, I would keep them that way and try to keep them that way. Um, work with one family group or individual group at a time. This will be really helpful not only to you as you're working through it, but as to future generations as well. A lot of people ask us about white gloves. Um, you see them on TV shows. And for most of our personal papers, you're not going to need white gloves. You just want clean, dry hands um, to, to hold them. Gloves can actually snag the paper and do more damage. It can, it can actually tear it. So no need. Um, if you do have some items that you're not sure or they're really dusty, you might want to get um, just some of those really basic latex, or maybe not like, you know, like Rubber gloves is what I'm looking for. Rubber, some kind of glove to protect your hands if you're worried about that. Now, you may encounter some mold, mildew, or other unmentionables like bugs as you're looking through this stuff. Because I mean, if it's been stored someplace where there's not a lot of climate control, and even if it has been stored in a climate controlled space, you can end up with that kind of stuff. Um, so for those items, you're gonna wanna quarantine them. Um, and I always, you know, gallon size Ziploc bags, especially the kind with the slider that makes it easier to open and close, um, are really good for, for quarantining, stuff like that. So, before you start clumping individual boxes, I want you to get everything out of all of its hiding places. Um, all of the boxes and for me they were all over the house they were under beds they were in closets um they were everywhere um and there were some at my parents house and i had to get those and once i had everything together i found a temporary storage place in the main part of my house away kind of away from pets and kids not really um if you have a bedroom a spare bedroom with a door on it you are golden <laughs> because you can put the stuff in there and the kids and the pets won't bother it or shouldn't bother it. Um, so I used my dining room 
Um, and I was lucky enough that my kid was old enough that he didn't, wasn't interested and my pet was only marginally unhelpful. So, um, so here is an example of what my boxes looked like at the building. At the beginning, they are truly a mess. Um, what's that old saying about a cobbler's kids have no shoes? Well, the public historian's personal papers are a mess. Um, as you can see, I've got photos mixed in with papers and newspaper clippings and film negatives, and there's a woman's lace clutch in one box. It's just, there's, it's just everything. So you'll want to assess you want to get everything out. You want to assess all the different types of things that you have. And you want to think about big categories here. So letters, documents. Yes, those are different things. Letters, documents, photographs, and then kind of other random stuff. And if you have enough stuff in, in a kind of a random category, newspaper clippings or some three-dimensional objects or things like that, or maybe not three-dimensional, but not exactly two-dimensional. Letterman letters are an example. A purse is an example. You'll want to keep those and make their own category. Um, if you're, again, remember, if you're dealing with more than one family group, um, please try to work with only that group at a time. It will really be helpful. Um, and you want to put everything in a more universal order. But pay attention when like things are together. Make notes on a separate piece of paper about what you notice, some, some kind of patterns that you start to see. Um, and I recommend taking lots of digital photographs, not only um, to keep up with what, you, what you're doing, but also you might want that for posterity and that could become part of your personal archive. So where to work. You want a clean, clutter-free work area. You want a flat surface. Some One person had a ping pong table. I really kind of sort of wanted to go out and buy a ping pong table after they told me that because I thought, perfect. But for most of us, it's going to be a kitchen or dining room table um, or maybe a bed in um, a spare bedroom. Um, you're going to want to wipe or dust the surface before starting. You don't want to use pledge or furniture polish. Just kind of wipe it down. If you do need to like use a damp cloth, make sure it's good and dry before you start, um, before you start using everything. And I actually ended up putting a towel down, an older towel that didn't have a lot of, um, I guess, grip to it, just so that things would kind of stay in their place. Um, should my coworker, who is my cat, decide to take off across the dining room table, which she tends to do and scatter everything. So, um, if you do have a coworker like a cat, you may want to segregate them to another part of the house because they are not helpful. Um, he claimed this box early on. It's got a bunch of old bank statements that I was going to throw away anyway, but I just kind of let him have it. I was like, here, you can just, you can just be here for this part. Um, so at this point, you're just clumping like things together. Um, keep envelopes with their letters. Don't staple things together, but don't remove staples either at this point. Um, and you might want to use paper, paper, let me try that again, plastic paper clips if you are really worried that something's going to get separated. So group all of your photos from one box together, all of your letters, all of your documents, you know, kind of almost like size, like type things. If you have stickers or writing on them, particularly photographs, you don't want to remove the stickers or try to get rid of the writing, but you don't want to add stickers or writing either. If you have photos in paper frames, like the photo there on the right, don't remove it from its, don't, don't take it out of its frame unless it's falling out. If it's falling out and there's no important information on the frame, that frame is highly acidic, get rid of it, throw it away. Um, but if it does have information on it, you want to wait until you've processed it. And if it's stuck in there, just don't worry about it. Um, if you have tintypes or daguerreotypes, don't remove them from their casings. It will ruin them. So you get your letters, your newspaper clippings, your papers and your other documents into light groups. If items are in separate pieces, keep them together either with a plastic paper clip or in an acid-free folder or envelope. 
If you have any books with flowers pressed in them or where the pages are interlaced with newspaper clippings, set the whole thing aside. They're very, very special and they need to be handled differently. The same goes with family Bibles. So here's the same box that I showed you at the beginning after I had gone through and clumped everything. <clears throat> Think of this as your first pass at organizing. You're gonna organize again, a little bit more in detail, more micro organizing um, before you start digitizing. So the evils of tape and other randomness. So as you're clumping and organizing your collection, you will come across things like tape, ink pen and other issues. Here is what you might find and how you might deal with some of that. So this is a document from the Tennessee State Library and Archive where it has been taped together both horizontally and vertically and the tape has eaten away and they've actually lost information in the document. It looks like it also may have some burning, although no, that's probably just eaten away. Metal paper clips. Oh, how we love them. So you can see here, this is a three page document. So the, the page at the top has got kind of the metal where you can see the metal clip and then where the metal clip is eaten away at the paper at the other two pages. And then rubber bands. And what you can't experience here through the power of television is <laughs> that that rubber band is gooey and sticky and nasty. Um, so these are some things that can be really, really problematic. So I'm going to get on my soapbox for just a half a second. Um, there is no such thing as archival tape or adhesive. All tape is bad. Please do not use it. Um, archives spend a lot of time and money removing tape from things. Um, and it is, you can see the number that it'll do on stuff. So how do you keep things together? Well, you use Mylar sleeves. Um, that's really the best way to do it. And um, Mylar, they come in a variety of sizes and they come where either they're, um, sometimes only one side is sealed. Sometimes two sides are sealed like an L and other times three sides are sealed like a U. I recommend the one side or the two sided kind where you can just slide your item in and it's kind of gonna form an, um, an, not an electrostatic charge. I was trying to say elastic and it was, that's not a less electrostatic charge and kind of keep it in there. Um, mylar sleeves can be kind of expensive. If you want to kind of be economical about it, you can buy a bigger size that's sealed on one side and cut, cut them across. So you still have that one piece of sealing um, that works. Um, so if you have items that already have tape on them, please don't try to remove it. It's a very difficult process. You will digitize them and then you'll just need to make a decision whether the item is important enough to you to send it to a paper conservator um, to have the tape removed, or do you just want it to let it do its destruction or do you want to throw it away? You'll probably find some film negatives in your stuff. Negatives are important. They are the original. Um, if you have them, handle them with care. Use clean, dry hands. Only handle on the edges. Get negative sleeves to house them. Um, and then you can also buy archival friendly or archive friendly binders so that these negative sleeves um, will sit in there. In order to digitize the negatives using our machine, you do have to take them out of these sleeves and they go into our little, we have a little um, frame that they go in to digitize them. But um, for the long haul, this is great. If you are fortunate enough to have glass plate negatives, be very careful. Um, you're gonna wanna have them carefully conserved and housed by professionals. So your old photos are probably going to be labeled on the back. Um, a lot of people do this. It's really common and it happens. <laughs> so don't try to erase or remove or white out the markings. 
um, but don't add new markings. So you can see here on these photos from my collection, I've got ink pen, um, which it sometimes kind of pushes through. Um, I've got ballpoint pen, I've got some pencil, and then I've also got a printer stamp and a handwritten label in pencil. So, I mean, labeling is terrible for the item, but it can be really helpful in identifying people in photographs that you don't know. So for months, I've been doing this program and I get to the slide and I say, I have no idea who these folks are, but thanks to the back, I know that it's New Year's Eve, 1968, 1969. So um, a month ago when I was saying that, I looked, I actually looked at the photo and that's my aunt and uncle with some woman that I don't know. So I have since figured out who the people are and sometimes that works. Also, you can send this photo to once it's digitized to your family and they may have been able to identify far earlier than I would um, who these people are. So, hang on, sorry y'all. Dry lips, dry mouth, okay. So you want to look carefully. I always like to say, listen to your photos and let them tell you their story. At first glance, the number on the back of this photo might look like 1978, but the clothes are not from 1978. And I know for a fact that one of the girls in the picture was an adult in 1978. So I took a picture of the back of the photo with my phone and blew it up. And lo and behold, it says 197B, which is probably just a printer stamp. So don't just assume that what you see the first time is exactly what it is. And sometimes, despite your best efforts, this happens. Although nobody can convince me that this was not someone intentional because it's just her face. There's a story here. At some point, maybe I'll find it out. So I had one of these, I actually had several of these postcard albums with this kind of brown black paper in it. That paper is highly acidic. Um, thankfully, the photos and the postcards, there were a lot of postcards, but there were photos too, were not glued or taped in. Um, so I took reference photos of how everything was organized. And then I took all of the photos out to scan individually. And I actually threw the photo album away because of its acidic properties. So what if there's already damage, which it happens? Um, I took as with this, I pulled apart pages as best I could um, in no way in an archival process. I was really kind of rugged with it. Um, I took reference photos and I ended up throwing it away. This is actually, um, I was able to figure out that this was a um, yearbook of sorts from Mulberry High School in Crawford County. And so others exist. Um, so I don't have the only copy of it. Newspapers, oh, didn't we love to print out, to cut out newspaper clippings and paste them into scrapbooks? And they are so acidic. So you can see what these newspaper clippings have done to the other side because it was closed. Um, actually, I kept the, I have a lot of these scrapbooks um, and I have kept them for the most part. I scanned each individual page with um, information on it and handled it that way. And I will keep these. I didn't throw these out. But I threw these out. So this was some kind of scrapbook that my mater the maternal side of my family had. Um, and so I scanned each, it had already separated, there was no binding left to it. And so I carefully scanned each page, and then I tossed it. I may have kept the picture with the rose, but I think I framed it. Magnetic photo albums from the late 20th century. Again, got lots of these, dozens of them, in fact. And um, some of my albums apparently were not good quality because the photos just kind of fall out of them. Others, those, those photos are stuck in there for good. Um, so I took reference photos. I would scan the whole page and then kind of make a line um, with the scanner so that it would just do the photos and cataloged those individually. 
If they're stuck in there good, please don't try to remove them. You can actually damage the photo to a point where you can't see what it is. It'll kind of curl. Um, but eventually they should release, right? Eventually it'll just let go. Baby books are often, um, things are often taped or glued into them. So take reference photos, scan them. Um, don't get rid of them. I think they're, I think they're wonderful and um, you don't want to toss them out, even if they've, even if they've got adhesive in them. Family Bibles are challenging um, because they are often made of the lowest quality materials and mass produced. So if you have a family Bible or family Bibles that are interleafed with recipes and different things like that, go through them very carefully, take out what's ever interleafed, maybe make a note of where it is. I mean, it might have been important that they put it in that specific spot. I don't know that this piece of paper was necessarily supposed to be in Deuteronomy chapter, what's that, 28. I don't know that that piece was supposed to be in there exactly, but um, I made a note just in case. There are, um, if, and then after you've taken everything out and you've, you've made note of where it was and you've scanned everything um, and you just have truly your Bible left, um, it'll continue to deteriorate to some extent. You can purchase um, a box to hold it in. Oftentimes they're Gaylord and other vendors sell them. Um, you can also like so there's the ones where it's got the plexiglass on top so you can actually see it if the Bible is particularly pretty. You can also get an archival box with archival tissue paper and put it in there. What I don't recommend doing is on Etsy, a lot of people sell wooden Bible boxes. Don't do those. Um, the wood from the wooden Bible box and the wood from the wood pulp that's used to make the Bible it's all going to just have a fabulous little feast in the, the Bible box. So I would not recommend that. Okay, so now you're going to clump again. So, and this actually, in some ways, is the more fun part, I guess. The first clumping is just getting everything organized, kind of seeing what you have, having the survey. And now you're really going to kind of look at your stuff. Um, you're going to want to get ready. By doing this, you're getting ready to digitize your items one by one. Um, and so go through each box before you start digitizing and get everything organized further. This is why I started grouping um, like photos together. So here is one of my boxes after I've done the second clumping and I tried to put family groups together. So again, my stuff was all mixed up. My dad's side of my family and my mom's side of the family. In some instances, it was just I had thrown it all or other people not just me, I had thrown it all into one box. So I tended to group people together, group photos together by who was in the photos um, or what part of the family it was in the photo. And same with documents. Um, yes, so that's, so, oh, if when you have a lot of photos, you're gonna wanna start looking and if you don't know the people, and maybe they're not really labeled on the back, you're gonna wanna look at the, the faces and the clothes to keep them together. So I had a whole bunch, I had a whole big old stack of little photos, that little square size with the ruffled edges. Um, and I had three different sets and I could tell that they were different because the children were growing up and the clothes were different. It was all Christmas. So it was like Christmas 52, 53 and 54. My grandmother had labeled them on the back, but not every single one of them. So I kind of laid them all out and made sure I made a matching set. Um, and this will come in handy also if there is labeling on the back, you can use like Christmas 1954 and allow the scanner to count up um, so that you don't have to name each one individually. So here is, here is some of those photos um, from those, that Christmas series. And um, I did know who these children are, but I was able to, to make sure I was keeping all of them together with the clothes. I used a whole lot of little sandwich 
bags, Ziploc sandwich bags, the fold over kind to group things together because I had to package everything up every night when I stopped working so the cat wouldn't get into it. Um, and I would post it note stuff on the outside of the Ziploc bag. Recently, we had a patron come in and she didn't use zip, Ziploc bags. She used those sheet protectors, which are bigger and longer, um, and she can reuse them, which was great because I felt like I was not being very environmental. Okay, so now once you've done your second clumping, and I would suggest that you clump a box at a time, do that second clumping a box at a time, you're going to you're going to clump the box the second time, and then you're going to go immediately digitize it so it's all fresh in your head. So now you're ready to go digital, um, and it's time to scan all your items. So you want to create a computer folder system and a digitization process that works for you. If you make it too complicated, you most likely won't stick with it, and you will end up looking like this baby. The point of all of this work is to digitize all of your items so you don't have to handle them. You will store the originals and share the digitized copies with friends and family and whoever else. So we're going to talk about file storage, digitization, and naming, file naming right now. So we're going to talk about what options you have for file storage, what formats you should be saving your photos in, as well as other documents, but we're mainly gonna talk about photos, and how to name your files. I always like to put a caveat here. I am specifically talking about photos and documents that are being scanned from their paper originals. This is not born digital. So these are not images taken on a digital camera or a smartphone or on Facebook. Um, that is a different thing in a different class, which we will at some point get around to developing. Storage. Digital storage is so incredibly important um, because you do not want to have done all of this work and then have your digital storage fail you. It's also important for findability of your items as well as usability um, and being able to share them with other people. Ideally, you want to store your digital files in at least two geographically different locations. And when I say geographic, that can be the cloud um, to safeguard against a massive data loss. We recommend three different types of storage, storage solutions for your personal archive. The cloud, an external hard drive, or a personal server. Once you've picked a storage solution and upload, uploaded all of your digital items, you want to check in on your files at least once a year to make sure that the storage device is working and that your files are still accessible. Put an automatic reminder um, on your calendar, you know, one of those repeatable things, so it'll remind you to do it and then actually do it. Okay, so before we talk about the good storage solutions, we're going to talk about the bad. Um, these are not long term storage options, digital storage options. So floppy disk, nope. CD ROM, nope. DVD, nope. Flash drives and jump drives. These are not long-term storage solutions. I'm so sorry to be the bearer of bad news. If you have photos or other documents stored on these items right now, I would recommend getting them uploaded to a cloud storage or transferring them to an external hard drive ASAP, maybe even before you start scanning the other stuff. Um, these items can degrade so quickly. Um, it's just, it's incredible. So please don't use those. So let's go to the happy thing. What's good? Um, cloud file, sorry, cloud storage sites like Google Drive, Dropbox, or iCloud are convenient and reliable. Um, an external hard drive, which is a small device, and one of these days I'm going to have one here to hold up and show you. It's a small, usually square rectangular thing with a cord sticking out of it. Um, it will often you can get them at like a terabyte or two terabyte. Um, you can store lots of stuff in that and have it in a centralized place. And also you can have your hands on it. If you don't want to have it in the cloud, you have your hands on it. A personal server is going to be your most expensive option and you're going to need to be ready to maintain it with backups and other maintenance. So 
if you are not a tech person or do tech for a living, personal server may not be an option. We tell people to use a cloud-based storage solution and an external hard drive, and that's what I do. Um, I can share my cloud folders with family and friends, and they can look at it all. And then I've got my external hard drive over here with my second copy. Okay, now for scanning. For this part of the process, your mantra is going to be, this is a marathon, not a sprint. Um, to give you an idea, my personal archiving took me about eight months working off and on a few weekends a month for the scanning part of it. I have one patron who is digitizing a large number of photo albums. He has been coming in several times a week for, for two hour appointments since May and he's about halfway through. So it does take time. Um, you're working with a flatbed scanner. It's really the best way to scan your photos and documents. The new flatbed scanners will let you put a number of photos on the glass at one time. You do a preview scan. Um, ours actually, you click this little um, icon that says thumbnail and it'll identify all of them separately. And then it does a final scan um, to, to your folder. Um, you can also get adapters for negatives and other formats to make scanning easier. With documents, obviously, you can't necessarily have multiples, I guess with postcards technically, but you're going to have one sheet at a time. You're not going to be using an auto feed, so you're going to have to lay down the sheet, and if it's two-sided, you're going to have to turn it over and do another scan. Um, so it, ta it takes time. That's the whole point of that is it takes time. There are a lot of apps out there for both iPhone and Android, um, but we recommend using a tabletop flatbed scanner to get the best results. And I really haven't done any research on any of these, of these apps. I need to. Um, I'll get around to it at some point. Um, but, but you can look into them. But really, the tabletop flatbed is going to be your best option. So the Memory Lab at Cal's Roberts Library is a do-it-yourself lab for patrons to use with little or no assistance. This is a picture of the lab. This is the picture of the flatbed side of things. Um, it is equipped with a large format Epson scanner that can scan photos up to 11 by 14, as well as mounted slides and film negatives. And again, the amount of time it will take you to digitize your photos and documents will depend on how many individual items you have and the resolution that it's scanned at. So here are the scanner settings that we recommend. You're not scanning through an auto feeder, so you'll pick flatbed. You're gonna scan your photos, even black and white photos using the color setting. You're gonna to want to scan your items as a JPEG with at least 300 DPI, although we really recommend 600. Um, it creates a larger um, file, but you're, you're gonna have it for long, you're gonna be happy with it. Um, the scanner settings can be changed with each set of scans. So with each pass of the scanner and like you reload it, you're gonna be able to change it. So if you have smaller photos that you wanna do at a higher resolution, you'll be able to change it. So organizing your photos within the file storage device. Um, here's what my, I use a Mac, but here's what I had these three folders. I created these three folders. So Clarendon is my father's family, Ozark is my mother's family, and then unprocessed scans. I titled the images as I was scanning them with a real generic term in most cases, it was scan. <laughs> um, and then the computer would number it scan, scan one, scan two, scan three, as it was scanning. Um, it would dump them instantly into the unprocessed scan folder. I would rename them there and then move them to either Clarendon or Ozark, depending on where it was appropriate. <clears throat> and so here is what inside one of those folders looks like. And you can see I have a lot of repetitious file names. Um, I have ones and twos on the ends. The, the things that are in parentheses are often the back in on a Mac, you can use punctuation. Um, the, the parentheses on the back, you can add, I would add information about what was on the back of the photo. So I would make sure to keep that. So I didn't have to scan the backs of the photos as well, because that was just an extra file. So that kind of gives you an idea of file naming. 
But what if you don't know who the people are in the photos? Um, how do you name them then? Well, baby in blue vest sitting in a lawn chair. I have no idea who this child is. I have no idea where this is. Um, that fence doesn't even look familiar. So that's its unique name is baby in blue vest sitting in a lawn chair. So it's like a piece of art. So when you're all done, when you've scanned everything and you've gotten to the end, like the physical storage part, what's it gonna look like? Um, so I ended up with two photo boxes um, and two legal sized Hollinger document boxes. Here you can see the outside of one of my photo boxes and the inside with all of those archival um, photos. And then here's one of my envelopes kind of close up. I have about a dozen photos in each of these little envelopes. Um, originally, I started trying to like write out every name of every file and that was taking too long and I was not gonna stick with it. So I started this numbering system. So the one, so it says 1.25, the one is Num box number one, and this is envelope two, uh, envelope 25. And then I was able to also tag that on the photo in the cloud. Okay, so AV, this is, this is my last slide and then we'll take questions. So that's, that's the flatbed side of things. For AV, which we've just opened, like I said, like I said last week, um, it, we do VHS, you can, you can digitize VHS, beta, or audio cassettes. This happens in real time. There's no way to speed it up. Um, so if you have a two hour VHS tape, it's going to take two hours to digitize it. And then a little bit of time, like 10 minutes, to render it to a digital file and then upload it to the cloud. Um, you will, even though I told you that flash drives are bad, we do allow people to use a flash drive for a very temporary storage solution, but you cannot use a flash drive for these files because they're so large. Um, we had somebody come in and digitize something the other day and it was a really long playing tape. Um, I think it was actually five hours and his file ended up being 400 gigabytes. That's a lot. So um, just be prepared for that. So that's why we like to tell people that you can, you can reserve both sides of the memory lab at the same time. So you start your digitization of a VHS tape, and then you go and you scan some photos while that's working, unless you just want to watch it. Okay, so that's everything. Um, deep breath. So if you have any questions even after we're going to take questions here in a minute, but if you have any questions afterwards, you can always email us at memorylab at cals.org. Um, and this information is all on robertslibrary.org slash memory lab. Um, before I start taking, okay, I'm going to stop my share. Before I start taking questions, I do want to um, tell everybody. So right now the memory lab is open Tuesday through Friday, 10.15 to 4.30 p.m. So there's three appointments, three two-hour appointments. There's 10.15, this is all on the website too. 10.15 to 12.15, 12.30 to 2.30, and 2.30 to 4.30. And we do need you to be out by 4.30 or a little like 4.35. Um, so those are the appointment times, Tuesday through Friday. If you need a Saturday appointment, you just need to email us at memorylab.cals at memorylab at cows.org in order to ask for one of those appointments. They are um, by request because we don't have a staff member here on Saturdays yet. Um, maybe that'll happen at some point in the future. So go ahead and type your questions or raise your hand if you would like to ask a question live on camera or on audio. Um, anybody got any questions? Did I make it clear as mud? Yes, Judy, unmute yourself. If you have very oversized, like full newspaper products that are much bigger than 11 by 14. Yes. So I have just ordered an, a small overhead book scanner for the memory lab. And so basically you lay your item facing up 
and the scanner comes out over it. So we will have that. I just don't yet. Um, probably in the, probably I would say in the next six weeks, I'd have it up and running. What and is the maximum size that will copy or digitize? Good question. I did not look. We do have one downstairs in our research room that is super, super cantankerous. But if you get it on a good day, it will scan for you. Um, and it'll scan like full open um, newspapers, the whole thing. Okay. So whatever size, I mean, that's really big, right? So whatever size that is, that'll scan it. This doesn't scan quite that big, but it'll scan bigger than 11 by 14. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, Leslie would like me to talk about TIFFs versus JPEGs. I've heard that, that JPEGs deteriorate every time you access them. That's possible but I don't oh, so we we see TIFFs as one of the most stable I mean sorry we see JPEGs as one of the most stable um, formats and so that's why we recommend it also it's a more reasonable file size um, but if you are really if if you really want a good file size and I will look into the deterioration thing I don't know that off the top of my head but um if you want to use TIFF, I mean, our scanner will scan at TIFF. It's just a much larger file size and it will take longer. It takes longer to process the, the scan um, as opposed to a JPEG. So um, I'm wondering if that deterioration every time you access it is over like a thousand year life kind of thing. Sometimes those statements are made and the I'm going to look into that though, Leslie, and I will let you know, because <laughs> I have not heard that before. Um, I have a question. I have a question above. Yes. yes. How, do you have a recommendation on how to do real to real movies? I don't think you covered that. The no, I don't because we, um, we do not do real to real and we probably won't do real to real. Um, there are, I don't, I don't know. We send ours out. As an archive, we send our reel to reel out. So um, I can get you some recommendations of some companies that do do it. Um, ours actually gets sent to California. Yeah. Um, because it is, but yeah, and actually the person that you need, I'm going to put her name in the chat, Anna Lancaster, who's my partner in crime on all this. She's really my, a the AV expert. And her email address is Anna, I'm sorry, is A Lancaster, L-A-N-C-A-S-T-E-R at cows.org. And I would email her with that question and she will give you the person. I have an easy question too. Uh -huh. uh, you said on the Hol Hollinger boxes, to only use legal well i have bought a bunch of them and i'm using the letter size so i'm just wondering why you're saying only get legal it's too so, late you know well and it's i mean legal i mean letter is fine so what we find um around here is that we end up never using the letter because we'll have one document that's legal size in a whole collection and you want the whole collection together. And so you don't wanna fold, you know, you don't wanna do that thing where you fold at the end. So by buying the legal size, you're just, you're taking into, into account all the possibilities. Okay. The other solution to that is if you have, so you put everything in your letter size ones and then um, when you're, when you get to your legal size or if you have deed documents, longer size documents, you just get a flat, a flat box for that. Yeah. Um, and I'm trying to see, I thought I had my flat box here, but I think that's a bit home. Um, I had a flat box and they come in all kinds. I mean, they come big enough for full size newspapers to go into. So, so yeah, so that's why I say legal um, so that people will. And will also, you said not use auto feed for documents that mm -hmm. why is that that's going to take for archival documents it'll tear them up so but it, it's okay unless you're concerned about that yes yes and i mean you know if you're 
if you're wanting to print off something that are scan something that just got printed two days ago, it's perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, for, for things that have deterioration or are fragile, you send it to that feeder and it comes out, yeah. you know, okay. much smaller than it was. So yeah. Oh, Mary, uh, Mary answered the JPEG question. The JPEG versus TIFF, it's each copy or save of a JPEG that is a deteriorated version. Yes, okay. <laughs> I do know that part. Um, yeah, no, every time you open it, it's not affecting it. It is, it is the save and the copy, yes. Um, so you can, you know, and you can always save as TIFF. Um, we just are really aware of how big a file size that creates and um, how much space that'll take up ultimately. Any other questions? Well, I do have another thing. Yes. Um, one thing you didn't talk about, and it seems really important, and I can't figure out in my own brain, it's like you can't save everything. So it's like make discriminating between what to keep and what to not keep because every paper I have in my house is not valuable. And mm -hmm. except maybe it is just to me, but not to my children or grandchildren. So do you have guidance or thoughts on how to discriminate? So I... I do have thoughts. I probably have a whole other program on what to save and what not to save. Yeah. Um, I always find that what I wish people had saved as a historian, what me, the historian, wishes somebody had saved is not necessarily what they saved. Now, that's not helping you any, right? But, um, you know, I used to have a laundry list of things that, like, if, if everybody could say this, Photos, photos that are identified are huge for us. We really like to know who people are. Um, so that's important. Um, there's a whole area of like land tra transaction documents that are oftentimes you have the only copy or that person has the only copy. Um, so those are always good in appointment, I mean, good and important. But I like, I like kind of random things like you know, old check stubs, not every check stub you've ever had, but a sampling of how checks have changed over time. Um, because there's a lot of people that have never seen a check, never written a check, don't know what, you know, don't know what a check looks like. So, you know, some of those kind of things, I, I think you just, it, but it is a personal thing. I, I can't really give you a whole lot of guidance. It is a personal thing. You know, if, I guess I could say if you feel that it's important, um, then then somebody should somebody should also feel it's important. So, you know, my grandmother didn't save a bunch of stuff from the thirty uh, from the twenty seven or thirty seven floods, and mm. I mean, I'm sure she thought it was just a bunch of junk. Actually, she thought everything was a bunch of junk. So I wish she'd saved that stuff. Um, so yeah, I know that wasn't a very good answer, but well, it's it's a it's a tough thing to do, but it is. Tough. You can't keep everything, and you know that yeah. those who come after you are just gonna like where what do they do with it? So yeah, yeah, um, you know, I mean, one thing is you can if if you think that your that your children or your grandchildren are not interested in it, reach out to an archive, see if they're interested in it. Um, before you throw everything, bef not everything away, before you just make decisions on what is important and not, see if they're interested in it, um, because they might be, and they're the ones that are going to have a better idea of what would be important to, you know, to what goes along with their collections, what other things they're collecting. Right. Personal letters, I always tell people to save personal letters, and sometimes people feel like they're too personal to save. Um, man, I would love, I, there were some letters I threw away a long time ago that I wish I had saved. Um, so personal letters, I save all kinds of greeting cards. Maybe nobody's ever going to want them, but I do save those. Um, so yeah. 
Thank you. Okay, looks like we've got um, a couple of questions. Yes, I am Louis Sabinden, Judy. I am Louis Sabinden's um, niece by marriage. His nephew is my husband. Um, and so, yes, and I actually get that question a lot um, in these programs because my last name is so unusual. So, yes, um, he was. He has he passed away about two years ago, but he is um, I, I met him a number of times and we went to Port Aransas to stay in their house. So, yes, that's a common that's a very common question. Um, Mary wants to know, do you need to have an iCloud established and know your iCloud address and password to archive a VHS? Yes, you need to go ahead and have your iCloud. If you have if if you have a Mac. Um, or an iPhone with an Apple ID, you already have iCloud. Um, if you have a Gmail address, you already have a, a Google Drive. Um, so you can use any of those. Dropbox, you have to do individually. Um, and those are the three big ones that we recommend, mainly because they seem to be, a, they seem to be here to stay. And that's the biggest thing with, with cloud storage. You want something that's reliable. Um, and that's here to stay because you're basically entrusting your stuff to somebody else's uh, maintaining it. So that's why I use a cloud and um, an external hard drive. Any other questions? Back to the back to the what to say and what not to say. Um, I would I think I would say also save more than you think you should save. Um, but then let me give, let me give you a personal example. My grandparents, my mother's parents were lovely, lovely people, and they lived in a big four bedroom house um, and they had a full bedroom set in every of the in all these bedrooms. So there was a there was a bed, a nightstand, a chest of drawers and a dresser with an over mirror. So they had a full set. And when we when they died and we went to clean out their house, um, there were not clothes in those drawers and under those beds. There were papers. My grandfather had saved every bank statement he had ever gotten from 1955 forward. Um, that's a lot of paper to have to deal with. They also hid money, um, cash. And so we had to go through everything. So um, I guess so between save more than you think, but also think about your family and what they're gonna do, um, and, you know, how they're gonna have to go through it after, after you're gone. I'll tell you my plan for letters. I've got letter every, I've got letters dating back 80 years and, uh, and more than that, but I'm trying to go through them, picking out the interesting ones, putting those in one box and then putting the others not thrown away but leaving them for somebody else to throw away because yes. they just can't store them. But yes, try to yes. save some that are more interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is, and it's, it is difficult to, to make decisions and, and to know what's going to be important in the future. I mean, as historians, we tend to just look at what we're left with and, and we make do. Um, but you know, I mean, I, I, when I open up, an, when I open up a collection and I see letters or menus or um, souvenir postcards, all that kind of stuff, that's telling me more about the person's life than I could get from a census. That, that's the kind of way I look at it is like the census is a snapshot of, of people every 10 years. And there's a lot that happens in the intervening nine years and so how can you establish that story? And, and as archivists and historians, we do that with what you've left. So um, Mary would like to know, what's the projected date of a purchase of equipment to preserve Super 8? And this is, this is the number one question we get. Um, we don't know yet. It is 
it is on the horizon, but it may be pretty far off. Um, it took us longer than we anticipated to get the VHS and beta and audio up and running. Um, and so, cause we had kind of sort of thought we would have it earlier in the summer. So it took us longer to do that. Um, and so hopefully maybe early next year, um, but I don't want to make any promises because that's actually not something I do. It's what my coworker does. I don't want to commit her to anything. Um, but yeah, that's, that is in the plan. That is in the works. So if there aren't any more questions, we'll just end it here. Thank you everybody for um, showing up and attending. I really appreciate it. Um, you can email memorylab at cals.org. Those come to, to Anna and me. So you can, you can do that. Um, and we hope to see you all here in the memory lab sometime. Thanks. <laughs>